17. Matthew 17, we're going to be reading verses 14 through 21. I should say I'll be reading it as you follow with me. I'd like to ask you to stand with me as we read the Word of God together. Matthew 17, verses 14 to 21 says, And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to him, Because of your unbelief. For surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you'll say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Father, guide us in your word, teach us your word, encourage us in your word, teach us about prayer and fasting today. And Father, we pray that you will help us to be a people that's known for our prayer lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You know, back in the old days, they used to have the congregation stand for the whole sermon. Some of you don't have those legs, do you? <laughs> for an hour and a half message that stand. Their messages went a long time. I've got a dear brother from Laurel, Mississippi. I still remember hear, hearing him say this. He says, do you know what God can do? Now, he is a lot taller than I am. And he'd be leaning down, you know, preacher man, what God can do? He goes, well, I know a lot of things God, he can do anything he wants. <laughs> He's right. So why in life, if I serve a God that can do anything he wants, why don't I see his hand at work in my life and in my community? If I serve a God that can do anything he wants, which I do, why is it that it seems that prayer hits the ceiling and falls back onto my ears and that's as far as it goes? I'm going to be starting an eight-week series on prayer and fasting. I'm going to start an eight-week series on what God wants us to be doing as we live here in this world as far as prayer is concerned. And as I thought about that, my mind came to the situation in Matthew chapter 17 where the disciples had seen some amazing things and they still didn't believe. This morning I want to talk about the failure of Jesus' disciples and about the frustration of Jesus with his disciples and the faith that moves mountains. To understand verses 14 to 21, you need to go up on the mountain with Jesus in verses 1 to 13. Remember what happened. Peter, James, and John. Peter and the two sons of thunder, you know, the bikers. <laughs> they went up on the mountain with Jesus. And they saw something that not another person had seen. Jesus pulled back his glory. He was transfigured and he shone like a light. And they saw the glory of God there on that mountain. And it was so great. They said, oh Lord, let's just build some tents here to live here. Let's just live up here. One for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And they thought that was great. And Jesus said, or the father said, this is my son. More on Elijah and Moses. Listen to him. And they are on the mountain. They're seeing the glory of God. They climb off the mountain and are brought face to face with a horrible situation. A man meets Jesus as he's coming off the mountain. 
And he says, Lord, have mercy on me. You, you know, we, we tend to sanitize the Bible. Make it to where, like, emotionless. Maybe it's our poor reading skills. I don't know. But understand, this guy's got tears. As you read this, the man comes to him and he's like, Lord, have mercy on my son. He's an epileptic and he's suffering severely. And often he falls into the fire and often in the water. This thing's going to kill him. Uh, as a parent, and you have a ch child that is ill, it breaks your heart. And the father goes the only place he knows to go, to the Lord Jesus. Would you take care of my boy? He's got epilepsy. And when it takes him, there are times he falls into the fire. There are times he falls into the water. It's a hard disease. It's hard to see. It's hard to be around when someone has a grand mal seizure. And he said in verse 16, And I brought him to your disciples, and they could not cure him. Here's a young man with a disease at the end of his rope. Jesus gave his disciples at this time power as sign gifts to prove their message. When he sent the 70 out before him, they, the purpose was to gather the crowd for the Palm Sunday for Jesus to enter in and for them to cry out for him as their king. That was the purpose of the 70 going out. And because of that, Jesus gave them power over sickness and over disease. He gave them power as a sign gift. By the way, these gifts, the healing, and I believe God heals, but the gift of healing, per se, was a sign gift for the New Testament time, the New Testament church. We always think, well, Bible time, never we got healed all the time. There are only three occasions that you see healing taking place. There's a time of Elijah, Moses, the miracles, in the time of Jesus and his apostles. It didn't happen frequently. It was authentication for their ministry. And basically, this guy's saying, your disciples, they haven't shown me anything yet. They can't heal my son. They can't do a thing for my family. And I realize that there are times of desperation where we want to see God do something And it doesn't happen. Listen, when you see this boy, you understand the full effect of sin. I'm not saying that this boy had some terrible sin over other people. But the result of Adam and Eve's sin in the garden affected all of their descendants. The diseases we deal with is an indirect of the sin that was passed on from Adam. We understand that. And the effects of sin uh, oftentimes is ugly. It's always ugly. But sometimes it's more ugly than other times. This is one of those ugly times. And the disciples tried for whatever reason, whatever way, and they failed. You ever wonder why God allows you to fail in life? Put yourself as a disciple. Imagine if everything you tried in life was successful. Now, I don't know about you, but you wouldn't want to be in the room with me. If everything I'd ever done was successful, First of all, I couldn't get through that door because of my head size, you know. Boy, I'm somebody. I'm not even all that successful and I'm all too often too, too proud and arrogant. You know what I'm saying. You ever ask, why am I going through what I'm going through right now? Why is it that the Lord is allowing me to have this problem I've got? Now, some of our problems are due to our own making. I understand that. 
some of our problems. I have um, two artificial knees. I can tell you how I tore up both knees. Both were my fault, okay? Just so you know, both were my fault. Um, one, as I was arguing with God, said I'd, I'd serve him once I was done playing football. I said that on a Sunday night. Thursday, I ended playing football forever. Um, the other was another cocky moment in my life, and I thought I was really, really good at martial arts, and tore an ACL in the left knee. But there are some things in my life that I don't see as my fault. I didn't do anything more than anybody else to create this problem. I was going to say my diabetes, is that my fault? Well, maybe it is, the way I ate beforehand. God has a reason for failure. There are times that we fail because God is teaching us something really, really important. There are times that God allows you to fail to build your character. There are times that God will allow you to fail to draw you close to him. There's all kinds of reasons why we go through struggles and problems. But that is not the case here. Why did God allow his disciples to fail? Because they didn't believe him. Because of their unbelief. And in fact, you see the frustration of Jesus bleeding through the pages of the Bible here as you read verse 17. Oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? Okay, this is some um, American redneck for you who, who know me well. You unbelieving and twisted knotheads. <laughs> how long am I going to put up with you and your lack of belief? You know, I think Jesus spent a lot of time frustrated with the disciples. I see that all over in the Bible. Not at their failures in their lives, but their failures to believe him and to trust him. I mean, think of the times. They're in the boat. The water's coming over the edge. Don't you care that we're dying? And, and Jesus calms the storm. You know, sometimes the disciples just didn't get it. I mean, they never really caught on until after the resurrection, the truth be known, and even then they had a hard time with it. Jesus came, and I understand he lived his life among sinners, among people who needed him desperately. Luke 19 says that he came to seek and to save that which was lost. But the people that were supposed to be on his team never got it. That's where the frustration comes. Jesus says, how long? How long will I bear with you? How long will I keep putting up with your faithlessness? And Jesus said, bring him here. Reduke the demon, and it came out of him. The child was cured. Not all epilepsy comes from demonic possession, but this one did. And the disciples, quietly, come to Jesus and says, uh, Why couldn't we cast it out? What were the magic words you used? You know? What's the formula? You get into some of this, what I call mumbo jumbo belief. You, know, you got to say the right formula. You got to touch them in the right way. You got to do this. You got to. Why, why didn't we? Why couldn't we do it? Did we not say the words the right way? And Jesus lays it out for him. Says because of your unbelief. 
because you choose not to believe me. They kind of believed in Jesus. They mostly believed in Jesus. They were following, but when it came down to it, they didn't believe him. They didn't trust him. When they were faced with a demonic spirit that was absolutely destroying the life of this young man, they chose not to believe. I'm convinced that faith is a matter of choice. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to him in prayer. Beloved, lack of faith will always limit you when it comes to serving God. Like a, there are a lot of people that are almost born again. You know what I'm saying? They got it in their head. They understand it. They understand the facts about salvation. They understand the fact that God says they are a hopeless sinner on their way to an eternal lake of fire. That they are separated from God because they're sin. They got that. They understand that Jesus, as the God-man, lived this life on earth, a perfect life, and went to the cross and paid the penalty that they deserved on that cross. And he was buried and he rose again. And they understand that and they understand all they need to do is place their trust in him as their Savior. And they come right up to the edge. And they failed to jump. Now some of you saw this morning, at least one of you, I came up here, was going to jump onto the platform. And then I took the step. <laughs> I came right to the edge. I thought, should I? No, I'm not going to embarrass myself another week in front of people. One of these days, this new knee is going to let me do the jump. But there are people that are that way with Jesus. Their life is a shambles and they know their only hope is Jesus and they come right up to the edge. I'm not going to do it. They have the belief in their head, but it's not in their heart. Because they have never committed themselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. There's a word we use theological word. It's a good word. It's a word called repentance. The word repentance is a Greek word that's metanoia that simply means to change your mind. You see, we all live our lives for ourselves, by ourselves, the way we want to live. We got, we've got our own idea about what it takes to be righteous and what it takes to be holy and what it takes to be with God. And when someone comes to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, they've got that idea, they stop and they turn around and they follow Jesus. That is repentance. A lot of people never get to that turnaround because of their lack of faith, because of their unbelief. They come right up to the edge, and that's as far. I enjoy zip lining. I, we have a big zip line up at our camp. When, first year, I thought it was great, then I got yelled at. Y you know, any new thing, you know who's going to get yelled at for pushing it to the edge. And I was doing, I was doing flips on the thing, and, you know, and they said, you can't turn upside down on this thing. If you do that again, finally I said, you do that again and we're kicking you off permanently. Something about getting injured and hurt, I don't know. I love that. And I, I don't have a great fear of heights. I mean, I'm smart as the next guy, as most would think. But I'm not really all that scared of heights. Get to the edge of that platform, just, ah, jump off. 
Okay, you can tell on him. Okay, I'll, be, I'll give his name. Pastor Cox from Oskaloosa. Gets up on, gets a harness on, gets everything all ready. Everything cinched down tight. Gets it all clipped up to the zip line. And he goes to the edge of the platform. I go, jump, come on, just jump. It's fun, it's great. It's... Now he's seen 50 people go off that zip line. No one was injured. Not even this knothead. You know what he ended up doing? He sat down on it and crawled back. He missed out on the fun because he was afraid to step off the edge. Maybe that's where you are spiritually as far as salvation. You know all the facts. You know everything that you need to do to be saved. You know it all. But it's right at that edge and say, I can't do it. Can I encourage you to throw away that unbelief and step off the edge? Place your trust in Jesus. There's another thing I notice about unbelief. Unbelief will send you to hell. You know that. Unbelief will limit guide in your life. Jesus said, if you had the tiniest little bit of faith, the size of a mustard seed, but it's real faith, and you really believe God, even though it's a small bit of faith, you could say, mountain, move from there to there, and it'll happen. So why don't I see mountain move? Because I don't believe. Why is it that we don't see God doing great things in our lives? I say that. I've seen God do some amazing things lately. I've seen some mountains move. I'm praying God's going to move one huge mountain. I told him he was on my hit list, by the way. It's a guy, okay? It is a man, and he's as big as a mountain. I'm praying God moves that mountain, and I'm believing it. I've seen God move other mountains. People that on one occasion, let me just tell you one story. There's a guy that was having a discussion with me. We were half an inch from coming to blows. And it was going to be a bad day for both of us. I mean, a really, I mean, it was just, I kept asking questions and he kept getting mad. I thought, he's going to unload on me and everything calmed down. And I, you know, the first mountain move in this guy's life was I was praying God would just kill him. You know, get him out of here. Doesn't that sound great for a pastor? <laughs> he was limiting our ministry. Took me an hour to get over it. <laughs> hour on the road, and the Holy Spirit kept going. You know, spoke to my heart and said, Why don't you pray and get saved? Through some events that are what I consider no less than miraculous than moving a mountain. He suggested we do a Bible study at his place. And he came to know Christ as Savior. You don't believe God moves mountains? He's one of my close friends now. Listen, we don't see God move mountains in our lives and we don't see miraculous things happen because we don't really believe God will do it. Kind of like a friend of mine after we prayed. And before we prayed, I don't think God's going to do anything about that. 
We prayed, and he opened his eyes, and he no sooner got his eyes open, he said, See, I told you God wouldn't answer our prayers. I'm going. You, you get it yet? Of course God will answer your prayers. He may say no. You know, we don't like, you know, we're like petulant children. We don't like to be told no. I believe that God is frustrated with his church today because of our unbelief. The modern church has everything. We've got all the entertainment you could ask for, all the whiz-bang tomfoolery you want to think of. We've got it in the modern church. We've got everything but the Holy Spirit. We've got everything but God moving in our churches. And we're like the latest C and I'm church. I am wealthy and I have need of nothing. And I believe our Lord is frustrated because we simply don't believe Him. We don't believe Him enough to say no to things in our life. And Jesus points us to what's going to change us, and that is our faith. The great limiter in my life, the great cause of fear in my life, is my lack of faith. And Jesus says, listen, if you guys knew the power of faith, because it's not the power in me, it's the power of the living God. If you believe that God can do anything that he wants to do, then you believe that God can give victory in areas of life that you want to see him give. You, you, if God can do anything he wants to do, he'll move a mountain. Mustard seed faith isn't very big. Mustard seed is not very big. But it's bigger than the faith that most of us have. I've got a very dear friend from Nebraska. And it's amazing, especially when God brings your dreams together and you end up spending time on the road. And I'll see somebody... I mean, the guys in our Hellfighter units, they go, um, I know someone everywhere. I um, uh, met a guy down at the mission a couple years ago. He's from uh, Iron Mountain, Michigan, and I know, and I, and I know some. I said, do you know a Kevin Sullivan? He, goes, he was my football coach. And, and my, my BP, Trent, he just shakes his head and walks away. And I will often say to my buddy, say, man, it's a small world. The people God brings for you to pray with, to minister to, to work with. And it seemed like we're all interconnected. And I'll say to my brother Danny, I say, we've got a small world. He says, no, we've got a big God. You're right, brother. It's the best way I've been rebuked. If we have a big God, then we can believe that our big God can move in our world and change lives. We can believe that God can do anything he desires. He will make a way for you. If it's his will, it's his desire, and if that's what your goal, goal is, is to glorify him, he will make a way. And if he's got to kick down a mountain to do it, he'll do it. All too often in ministry, I get fearful, you know? What if I can't come up with the money? What if... And growing up the way I did, that's always my big thing. You know, what if I don't have money for that? What if that guy doesn't like me? What if he doesn't want me to minister to him? 
Maybe it's better off just not even to speak to him about the Lord because he might hit me. Looking at my nose, you know I've been hit once or twice. <laughs> you know what makes me afraid? My lack of faith. I don't believe God. If I will believe God, God will do some amazing things in my life. But all too often I say, no. If I believe God, then whatever God desires in my life, he'll produce. But when my life is about me, I'm scared. When my life is about my will and my desire, I'm frightened. Faith is about believing God enough to let go of this world and let God do the work. Look at what Jesus said in verse 21. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Why don't we preach on fasting? Why don't we pr practice fasting? Now, I know why I don't want to preach on fasting, because I like to eat. More than I want to see God in my, working in my life, and the answer is yes. That's my problem. When you start thinking about fasting, and we, we're going to have an entire service, an entire message dealing with fasting in the future. But when you deal with fasting, what you are doing, and it isn't just from food. There are a number of things you can fast from. What you are doing is saying, I believe God strongly enough that I'm willing to let go of the things that cause pleasure in my life so that I can have God do a great work in my life. That takes faith. To give up things that I like, to give up things that I enjoy. Oh man, I've got gooseberry pie. When I said that, a gooseberry pie just popped into my brain. <laughs> When I am willing to say no to me and yes to God, it tells me that my priorities are right. That's what fasting is all about. It's aligning our priorities to where it's no longer about me and what I want and me being a poor little brat who comes to prayer and says, gimme, 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 gimme. Prayer is a lot more than that. Fasting is letting go of worldly things so that I can take hold of eternal things. Fasting is letting go of my own desires so that I can see God accomplish His desires in my life. And Jesus says, if you want to see something amazing, you've got to be praying and fasting. And again, it comes down to this deal of faith. Why don't we pray like we ought to? A few years ago, I was on the golf course with another pastor. He was a, a better known guy than me. You know, he was one of these guys that was a, at one time flavor of the month when he moved to Iowa. You know, everybody had him here and there. We're on, we're on the green. After about 15 strokes, I was within putting distance. He was on the green in two. <laughs> he had about a 15-foot putt. And actually, we were closer in score on that hole than I'm letting on. And as he's lining up the putt, I leaned over and says, 
So how's your prayer life? And he shook me when he said it. But he's honest. He says, it's lousy. That's why I don't preach on it. Oh, by the way, he made the fight. <laughs> when big old curl went in the hole. How's your prayer life? Why don't we pray? Why is our prayer life so anemic? So passionless? So powerless? Is it because we just don't believe? Is it an issue of faith? Why don't Christians come to prayer meeting? It won't do any good anyway. That's the thought. A lack of faith. We need the kind of faith in our lives that moves mountains. We need the kind of faith that takes God at his word and said, where Jesus says, if you have the smallest kind of faith that you can imagine, but it's faith in the living God, God will take a mountain and put it into the sea. If we really believed the God of the Bible we would believe that phrase says nothing will be impossible for you. You see, we don't pray because we don't believe. We don't fast because we don't believe. We don't step out past our fear because we don't believe. What is amazing is the times in my life where I really believed in God to do something in my life. I just stepped back and watched him do something amazing because I chose to believe. Today I'm asking you to pray in faith, to believe in him. The first step is the sinner's prayer. You know that. You, to trust, trust in the Lord Jesus as your Savior. Any prayer you pray before you know Jesus as your Savior, God answers just by virtue because he's a, a, of, of his loving kindness. You know, he's not going to hear your prayers any other way except through the Lord Jesus. He is our mediator. There's one mediator between God and man. That is the man, Christ Jesus. First Timothy tells us that. We need the faith that moves mountains. We need the faith that changes lives. We need to simply believe God. That means believe him to trust in Jesus as your Savior, and that means to believe him in every area of your life. Our lives are to be lived by faith. Lord, why could we not cast it out? Because of your little faith. Because of your unbelief. Because you choose to trust yourself rather than believe me. trust God today? Would you believe in him and in belief pray and fast to see God work in your life? To see God work in your community and in your world? I don't know if you've looked at the news lately, but our world's in a shambles. Not just the United States. We need revival like we've never needed it. That means we need to pray in We're celebrating Memorial Day this weekend. It's a time to remember those who sacrificed for us. There'll be flags on graves all around our county. Tomorrow at 11 o'clock, they will read the names of those who had given their lives. We'll start out at the Memorial Wall to remember that men 
and women have given their lives for your freedoms. And as I think about that, I think of the Lord Jesus gave his life so you could have ultimate freedom. But he asks that you believe him, that you trust in him. Oh Lord, help my unbelief. Let's pray. Father, we want a great faith. We want to believe you. We want to trust you. We, we want to have the faith that moves mountains. And I pray that you'll help us to set aside ourselves and just believe you. Just trust you. Just allow you to lead us. Father, we pray this in Jesus' name.